see a lot of these things. So, uh, um, He's looking for saying that I'm running milk on 10,000 cores and not getting performance. <laughs> yeah. And Alicia will tell you, case is yeah. for 5%. <laughs> so I'll ever hear about it. So in that case, Google Home is hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think you, you guys have seen all of these things. So I, I'll uh, kind of skip over this uh, like portion. Uh, so this is what MAP is trying to achieve. And uh, what I'm trying to show is uh, when the rubber hits the road, what all uh, can go wrong, and how do you fix those things when it does go wrong? So we'll first start with the basic MAP2 uh, library. Note that whatever is being presented under the MAP2 uh, library is applicable to all of our uh, M like MAP star uh, software stacks. So this is kind of a, a high level overview which is common across uh, all software stacks. So this is a list of uh, features. This is a laundry list, uh, uh, so I'm not going to go over this. Uh, the slides will be available online, so please check that if you are interested. But at a high level, we have uh, like a lot of uh, pretty good interesting features like enhancements for job startup, point-to-point -point operations, collective operations, process mapping strategies. This is actually very important as uh, we go on to the multi uh, many core uh, era. Uh, you need to have good process mapping strategies uh, for them. Otherwise, you will get like pretty bad performance as uh, was uh, seen in like a, a couple of uh, talks back. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Professor uh, uh, like uh, Hanawa from uh, Tokyo uh, Institute of Technology, he, he mentioned that with Poor process mapping strategies, the jobs don't even start up. So you get like pretty bad performance if you do bad uh, uh, process to code mapping. And we have a lot of other miscellaneous uh, like uh, improvements uh, as well uh, as far as uh, the uh, code goes. So uh, let me move on uh, to the overview. So as with uh, anything, it first needs to start up. So you can have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, but if it takes 15 minutes to start up, nobody's going to drive that car. So uh, just uh, just like a car for an MPI library. What you need is a scalable and high performance startup mechanism. So once you launch the job in a second or a few seconds, it should actually be able to launch on like one, two, four or four thousand nodes. So that is uh, one critical challenge that uh, uh, we need, uh, we are trying to solve. And we are trying to solve that from two angles. One is your job startup performance as well as the memory footprint for job startup. So what is this memory footprint uh, deal that you're talking about for job startup? With InfiniBand, one of the problems is that you need to know whom you are talking to. So uh, Ethernet has this very nice ARP or ARP mechanism. So just from the host address uh, or host name, you can figure out what the MAC address is, IP addresses, and uh, like go and talk to each other. But InfiniBand does not have this very nice address, uh, uh, resolution technique. So you need to know what uh, the uh, the endpoint uh, information of your processes, and this needs to be exchanged between all the processes. So at a few hundreds of processes is not a problem, but once you go to thousands or ten thousands of processes, the address exchange, the amount of uh, like data it consumes on a node becomes an issue. So we are trying to address the uh, issue of job startup from both the performance as well as the memory scalability angles. And this is some of uh, the sample results that we have been able to obtain as far as job startup uh, performance uh, goes. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, we have been able to significantly improve the performance of job startup. This is at about full system scale on uh, st uh, the tax stamp, which is a KL based cluster. So we are able to start up a, almost a, like a quarter of a million uh, processes on the Stampede supercomputing uh, center in under one minute. So that's pretty darn, darn good job startup performance. So this is again a, a similar job startup performance number we took on the Oak, for Oak Forest PACS uh, system uh, in uh, Japan. So uh, this is about a quarter of a million. This is uh, at about 64,000 processes. So we are able to do uh, like job startup. Just uh, that means uh, coming out of MPI in it in about 5.8 seconds, and like a hello world, basically meaning all the processes have started up and uh, like finalized uh, in uh, under about uh, 20 seconds. So uh, what all do you need to uh, achieve this uh, performance? That is what we we'll, uh, uh, what we are trying to say here, and this is not just for MPI. It's also for other PGAS-based programming models like uh, OpenShmem. So we have also significantly improved the job startup performance of OpenShmem at similar, very large scales on uh, like 
uh, supercomputing systems. This was taken on the Stampede supercomputing system, uh, which has now been decommissioned at TAC. But as you can see, the time taken for Hello World was reduced by a factor of 8 at 8000 or 8K processes on uh, Stampede. Now, how do you achieve this and uh, how do you configure the job scheduler and the MPA library to achieve this? So that's what we are focusing on. So the focus of this uh, tutorial will be not on the actual designs, but more on how you as a user can utilize or enable these designs to ensure that you are running the MWAP 2 MPA library or your applications built using the MWAP 2 MPA library in the best possible fashion. So this is more of a user ed education uh, tutorial rather than trying to convey what the actual design is. So each one of these slides that you see here is a paper or in some cases it's an entire dissertation. So you can go into these things uh, like in uh, like whatever depth that you want to but we are just kind of highlighting the main uh, like takeaway results from each one of those uh, uh, works. So uh, we support multiple job launchers, Slurm and uh, like our default uh, built in MPR and RSearch are two of the uh, more popular ones that we support. So how do you configure a Vapage 2 with Slurm and with MPR and RSearch to get this kind of job startup performance at small, medium and large scale. So that's what this slide uh, says. So for Slurm you configure it like this and to get some of the more advanced features we have patches for various versions of Slurm like 15, 16, 17 and 18 uh, available for download from uh, our website. You can patch Slurm yourself, rebuild Slurm and then uh, uh, configure MAPH2 with the new Slurm uh, like this so that you kind of get the same uh, job startup performance using uh, like SRUN which is Slurm's native job launcher. Yeah, yes. Uh, so patch patches are just to improve the performance? Yes. With all those patches it will still work? Yes. Okay. Uh, What's the difference in terms of performance? So, uh, Saurav, do you remember uh, what the what the difference is? I, I think the patch was for the uh, like memory footprint uh, enhancements uh, and the non-blocking collector, uh, collectors, right? Uh, yeah, for Slurm, it has both memory enhancements and uh, it makes the uh, API unit uh, become flat. Yeah. So uh, this uh, flat time that you see, it is because we have like a non-blocking startup. So basically, uh, the thing is, right after MP init, very few applications do a, a, like an all-to-all -all kind of an operation. There will be some file read operations, or there will be uh, some uh, operations before uh, some communication happens. So the idea is that you can try to overlap that uh, communication, like the uh, the communication for exchanging endpoint information with whatever the application is doing in the foreground. So without those patches, you will not get this flat kind of performance. Uh, it might be somewhere between uh, like this line and this line here. It would still it will still start up, but you will not get this kind of fantastic looking uh, like numbers. Just to know if I should really bother my admin about applying this patch or not. <laughs> we, we we strongly recommend that you uh, bother your admin as much as you can. Uh, to uh, get it in. So we, we have been working with the Slurm community to uh, push in some of these patches. Some have gone in but the others are still under uh, review so um, we are not exactly sure and uh, like, uh, like mo uh, a lot of this work was done with Adam uh, like sitting right here. So we are trying to see if we can uh, push the rest into Slurm so that this patch business can be done away with but please do tr try the patch. It is going to significantly improve your uh, uh, like job startup performance. So I, I would uh, we would highly recommend that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, these patches are only uh, applicable if you are using s to launch. If you are using MPN and analysis, then you will still get the flat performance without requiring it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, do you know if uh, Hydra will try to use s in the background? Or mm -hmm. uh, because I know uh, if you use OpenMPI with Slurm, uh, the MPI run from OpenMPI will detect that Slurm is being used and try to use Slurm. So I don't know. To is the Hydra, is it the same behavior? Or? To the best of our knowledge, I don't think Hydra does that. Uh, Hydra still tries to launch it uh, like uh, by itself. I don't think it hops on the uh, SRN backend to do it. Uh, Adam or Saro, if you have any other information, uh, please chime in. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. L Lawrence Livermore is a big uh, Slurm house. Slurm more or less was born there. So, yeah. Livermore is a big Slurm house. 
and uh, MPR and RSET is our default and preferred launcher. Uh, so all these kind of uh, like uh, uh, impressive performance numbers comes for free if you are uh, using MPR and RSH. So one thing you can do is like TAC for instance. Um, so MPR and RSH came as a joint work with TAC. Uh, it came up because uh, about nine years back when the Ranger supercomputing system came by, uh, no job would start at full system scale uh, with the uh, launches which are available then. So what TAC does is they have an IB run script which is basically a wrapper around MPR and RSH. So that's also something that you, uh, you can do if you don't want to like try this patch business. So MPR and RSH gives you uh, like all of these parameters to play around with so that you can uh, try to improve your uh, performance. So this uh, MT degree uh, like had a pretty big impact uh, uh, to bring down this uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like job startup time. I think uh, it helped about uh, bringing down the uh, overall time by around 30% or so on uh, the Oakforest PSEA system and on uh, tax stampede when we were doing some evaluation uh, earlier last year. So again, uh, we recommend that you play around with these uh, values uh, like uh, if you are trying to do very large scale job launches uh, on your system. So that's as far as job launch goes. So once that uh, your job is launched, what next? So you have your communication operations, your, your job has been launched. So how do you ensure that your communication operations, your point to point, your collectives, your intra node, your inter node works fine? What are the options that MAPS2 provides uh, with regard to that? So th th that's what uh, we'll uh, look at next. So uh, how many of you are aware of uh, like eager and uh, rendezvous protocols and why eager and rendezvous protocols are there? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, so like a, like a fair number. So um, all MPA libraries uh, have this concept of eager uh, versus uh, rendezvous sends. So an eager send is where the sender knows that the receiver has enough buffer, enough internal buffers allocated to receive this data even if the receiver is not expecting this message. Okay, so what is the difference between the receiver expecting a message and not expecting a message? So scientific applications can proceed whichever way. There is no guarantee that uh, there is a synchronization between a sender and a receiver. So suppose you have a simple operation uh, program where the, you have process A sending and process B receiving. What if process B was late by like 10 seconds and it could not post, post the receive by the time process A uh, sent out the message? How can process A know for sure that if I send this message out to the receiver, the receiver has enough internal communication buffers allocated to buffer this message until the receive actually gets posted. So to ensure that uh, uh, like such uh, asynchronous communication can uh, be possible, most MPA libraries uh, define what is called the eager threshold. So the eager threshold uh, implies the amount of internal uh, like amount of uh, buffers which a receiver can uh, uh, receive without uh, having to expect that data. Okay. So this allows more asynchrony in uh, the communication between sender and the receiver. But obviously you don't want this uh, eager threshold to be very large because then that would bloat up the amount of memory footprint that each process has. But you don't want it to be very small either uh, because then you will uh, reduce the uh, like asynchrony in the communication. Another factor is the uh, mem copy overhead. So you know that uh, most modern HPC networks have what is called as uh, RDMA or remote direct memory access which means that uh, a process can remotely write a piece of data or read a piece of data to another process memory location. So if you have uh, this capability why do you want to do a copy from application buffer to internal MPA buffer then send out the data to uh, like a remote MPA process and then copy it back. Why can't you just write the data directly from the source buffer to the target buffer? But in order to do that, you need to know the target buffer ahead of time. So you will have to have some sort of handshake that happens. So this handshaking protocol is called a rendezvous protocol. So the sender and receiver synchronize, basically they do a rendezvous and say that, okay, I want to, I want to send this message to you. The receiver says that, okay, fine, you want to send, send this message to me here. Here is the buffer where you can send this message. The uh, sender gets this information and puts the data back. So this is the uh, uh, rendezvous protocol. So this helps you reduce the number of mem copies and also reduce the size of the uh, like uh, internal communication buffers the MPA library has to uh, like pre-post. So there is a sweet spot between uh, 
like uh, when you switch from your eager threshold to your, to your rendezvous threshold which is based on multiple factors uh, how costly uh, it is to like do a web copy versus uh, do a uh, rendezvous transfer to send the data directly from the sender to the receiver buffer and how much memory you want to allocate uh, to stage the buffers uh, in the MPI library and how much uh, like asynchronous communication you want to allow. So there are lots of factors here and various MPI libraries take a decision based on what is important for them. So do you want to allow more asynchronous com communication at the expense of uh, like uh, like a larger uh, memory footprint? Do you want to have uh, like basic communication, like better communication performance, uh, uh, like at the loss of uh, some uh, like asynchronous uh, communication? So there are all of these features and uh, there are lots of thresholds. So uh, what we found out was that for a lot of applications, the asynchronous nature of communications or enabling more asynchronous uh, communications is uh, better. But as an MPA library provider, there is no way for us to figure out what uh, this value is for each application. So what we would recommend is that there is this value called MV2 IBA eager threshold and there is a similar value for intranode as well. Play around with these things and see if, uh, if you are looking for like overlap of communication and computation. Uh, increasing or reducing this value is leading to better asynchronous communications for you. So we have seen that for a lot of applications like WRF, uh, like WARF, which is like a weather modeling code, playing around with these eager thresholds has a significant impact on overall application performance. So this is something that we would highly recommend that you play around with for your particular application uh, uh, in question. So why am I mentioning this? So let's analyze the overlap potential of eager uh, protocol versus uh, rendezvous protocol. So think that your application is doing some computation and after that it uh, schedules a send and a receive operation. Now if it is an eager protocol, the sender and the receiver knows that there are enough buffers posted on the receiver side to receive this particular message. Since most modern network adapters have the capability to progress communication without uh, involvement from the application uh, process, what happens is the application is free to perform useful computation in the foreground while the network interface card is progressing the communication in the background, provided the card knows that the receiver has enough buffer to receive this data. So that is where an eager protocol really helps because you have good overlap of computation and communication leading possibly to better overall application performance. The only problem here is if you increase the size of your internal communication buffers to a very very large value your memory footprint would increase and if you like uh, increase it to way too much values uh, you would possibly have a significant reduction in your communication uh, like message rate. So these are some numbers that we took with different internal communication uh, buffer sizes and as you can see with a smaller uh, communication buffer you get significantly higher message rate as opposed to a bigger communication uh, buffer. So again this is something that you need to be very careful about when uh, like choosing. So how about uh, like a rendezvous protocol? The problem with the rendezvous protocol is that uh, let's say if the receiver is not aware of the RTS coming. So in this case suppose the schedule operation was received and the receiver instantly went out to perform some com uh, uh, computation. So by the time the RTS came, the receiver was outside the MPA library and was not aware that the sender was actually trying to send some piece of data to it. So as a result, there is no overlap of computation and communication that is happening here. So this is contrary to what many application developers think. So what application developers think is that I am right, I'm using MPI I send and MPI I receive. My semantic is that I should get overlap. That is what the standard says. So you, you, you do an uh, I receive, you do an I send, you do compute, you do wait on. The theory is that the compute and the uh, communication in the background is getting overlapped. But the practice because of uh, the intricacies of uh, the MPA library design could be something like this. You get zero overlap. And what you actually would see is that at the end, at the wait on operation, that is where most of the communication is taking place. So instead of everything being finished here as the application developer expected, it is actually only finishing here leading to zero overlap. So this is where the rubber hits the road and where theory and practice diverge. So uh, the, the cases where, uh, okay, unfortunately Alessandro is not here. So uh, the cases uh, like uh, for uh, Alessandro where uh, you are trying to get better overlap of computation communication and you are not getting it, it could possibly be, be because of uh, like cases like this.
okay this is just one such example there are uh, there are lots of other such corner cases that could uh, uh, happen so here as you can see all the communication can take place in the final synchronization so the benefit of this is if you have an application which enters the mpa library frequently enough to progress the communication then you get good communication performance and minimal uh, buffer requirement but it is very easy to say that hey uh, poke the uh, uh, mpa library frequently but very very hard to do in practice so what typically happens is you get very poor overlap of computation and communication leading to poor overall application performance so we have some designs uh, which are coming up uh, in, in future release of the mpa mpa library which tries to do the same thing in a dynamic and adaptive manner so which results in high like high performance and high productivity so the, these are some uh, results uh, that we got with uh, the amber uh, molecular dynamics application so the key takeaway here is that if you can sit down uh, like profile your application and figure out what message size is going on and how to get best overlap for that particular message size for a given job size then yes you can get the best performance but figuring that out is very hard because it's going to change based on your job size your problem size your system size uh, and a bunch of such parameters further such tuning can lead to uh, like a lot a lot of wasted memory as you see from the uh, uh, memory consumption here so what we are trying to achieve here is can we get the best communication performance out of the box in a transparent way to application developers with without sacrificing like a lot of memory so as you can see here for different uh, like job sizes different uh, like communication internal communication buffer sizes gives best performance but they have different memory requirements as well so we are trying to do this in a dynamic and adaptive fashion so that the application developer does not have to do 100 runs to figure out what the best value is so this would be coming up in one of the future uh, releases of mvapish 2 so this is again uh, something to do with uh, tag matching so tag matching is very important because a process can receive hundreds of different types of messages from like the same process uh, from different communicators for different types of messages for point to point messages collective messages rma so on and so forth so how does the process figure out and like distinguish these messages and deliver the right message to the right application level buffer so th this process at a high level is called tag matching and tag matching has a significant overhead on overall application performance as well as enabling asynchronous progress so what we are trying to come uh, come up with here is come up with a solution that dynamically adapts to the communication pattern using different strategies for different uh, ranks and see if we can get better tag matching performance for uh, like different kind of applications and communication patterns with minimal uh, memory consumption to perform such tag matching operations again uh, this would be uh, coming up in one of the future uh, mvapish mpi uh, uh, library releases so that was uh, uh, what we uh, had to say at a high level about point to point operations uh, uh, any questions on this so far so one key takeaway that i would like uh, you to remember here is this like figuring out the overlap potential of uh, eager protocols and rendezvous protocols and picking the right protocol for your application to enable overlap of uh, communication and computation so this is very critical uh, for a lot of applications and this is uh, something that most application developers don't realize so they may be doing the right thing in theory but the practice is a uh, is a far cry from the uh, like actual theory so this is something that i would uh, Uh, mention as a very key takeaway because we have seen several applications uh, which uh, are written in the technically correct way but still don't get the benefit so this is something that i would uh, uh, ask you guys to keep in mind so just like uh, uh, the ethernet networks which have like tcp ip and udp infiniband uh, as well as omnipath have a lot of different transport protocols so just like tcp ip uh, infiniband has what is called as the rc or reliable connect protocol which is like fire and forget you send a message uh, something uh, is going to take care that that message is sent from the sender to the receiver correctly in order uh, crc is everything is taken care of and uh, things like that however just like tcp ip it has scalability issues if you are if you are trying to uh, like establish too many uh, tcp ip connections then you don't get uh, like a lot of good performance so 
Another option that we have is UD or unreliable datagram which is in a simple way uh, comparable to the UDP protocol. So there is uh, no reliability, uh, there is uh, no ordering guarantees, uh, so there is no CRC uh, checksum or uh, any of those things. But the, benef but, but the benefit is that it has fantastic scalability and uh, like pretty good message rate when you go to hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, thousands of processes. So what we are trying to see here is can we have the best of both worlds? Can we have a case uh, and okay another problem with uh, UD is that you don't have this uh, nice feature of RDMA. You, you cannot do one sided operations uh, with uh, UD. So what we are trying to do here is figure out if we can use RC for some communication and UD for some communication so that you get the best of both worlds as in get RDMA and all the other nice features for your more frequently used communications uh, while using UD for your less frequently used communications allowing you to get better scalability and better performance for your end application. So, this is again uh, something that you would see uh, across uh, uh, th like uh, this uh, talk. So, for each feature that we are introducing, we will have a bunch of environment variables that you can uh, like play around with uh, to see if uh, the default setting is not best for you. We will also point you to the section of the user guide with more information about this particular feature so that you can uh, like re like visit it once you once this session is over to understand more about this particular feature so th this is a like a, uh, like a feature that you would see throughout this tutorial so going forward one step uh, various vendors try to address this problem in a different way by uh, trying to come up with uh, protocols which are uh, which ensure reliability but are uh, like connection less uh, uh, in the manner of speaking. So that's what uh, uh, Marilox tried to do with the direct connect uh, transport or DC. So this is uh, kind of combining the best features of uh, RC and UD. So with RC just like TCP, you needed one Q pair or one endpoint to communicate with uh, like a different process. With UD just like UDP, you can just have one endpoint to communicate with any process. So DC combines the best of both worlds by allowing you to communicate with just one DC uh, endpoint to uh, any target process but also providing the full feature set uh, of uh, RC like RDMA, Atomics and all that nice features. So Mbappish 2 x uh, has, this support, has had the support for the last two years or so and as you can see you get pretty good improvements in performance by using this. And we have seen other cases where uh, like these deliver good performance uh, as well like uh, the neuron scientific application. And we have a best practices page uh, which I will uh, de uh, describe later on in this tutorial uh, which shows you how much uh, benefits uh, you get by using the right set of tuning parameters with MAPH2 for the right set of applications. Uh, so, uh, any questions on this before uh, we proceed further? Okay, so now let's go to multi-rail. So what is multi-rail? Typically, uh, most HPC uh, systems have one uh, network adapter per, uh, let's say, uh, host. What if you, ha you have multiple uh, network adapters per host? Can your MPA library take advantage of both network adapters to give good communication performance? So this is what we are trying to uh, address in uh, multi-rail. So th there are different kind of multi-rail scheduling policies as in different ways to bind processes to InfiniBand uh, HCS or Omnipath uh, HFIs. So you can say that I want to do rail binding as in one process will only use one uh, network adapter or rail sharing which means that one process will try to load balance its traffic across multiple network adapters and there are different kind of policies uh, in that as well. Now MWAPH2 automatically detects and uses all active uh, network adapters, uh, InfiniBand network adapters on a system and it supports all of these uh, rail binding policies and <coughs> common knowledge will say that in order for you to get best bandwidth you should try to load balance your traffic across all HCAs but that need not be the case uh, for uh, fully loaded uh, applications where all processes are trying to communicate all the time. So in those cases uh, as you can see here rail sharing might give you better performance than rail binding so that's what we observe as well so if you have all HCAs being used all the time then it is best not to try to 
balance your traffic across multiple XCS. Instead, it is better to uh, like split your processes uh, and bind them to separate HCS. So for instance, if you have four processes and two HCS on a given node, instead of saying that, hey, all four processes load balance your traffic across all four HCS, if the usage pattern is uh, equal, then it would be better to say that process one and two use HCA one, process, uh, let's say uh, three and four use HCA two. So that, that is basically rail binding. So th uh, the benefits uh, come from the internal matching and uh, reordering uh, issues. But again, yes. So that implies that you have to use multi-binary uh, launch to do that, right? No. You can have different, in, I mean, how do you set up the environment variables to say which interface to use for different? Yeah. So uh, you have a uh, like cross to rail mapping which determines how HCS will be mapped to rails. So you can say that, yeah. So you don't need multiple, so it's all kind of built in. But the one case where you may, uh, this may backfire is if you have uh, like unbalanced communication. If certain processes uh, talk more than certain other processes, then in those cases, the processes that talk more should have uh, the ability to use more number of HCS. So again, this is something that you need to uh, like decide based on your particular application use case as to whether you want to use rail binding or rail sharing. So if the communication is more or less even between all processes, then rail binding uh, would be better. But if there is some sort of unevenness in communication, then you would want the more heavily communicating processes to <coughs> be able to use more uh, number of HCS. So that those are cases where rail sharing can potentially have more benefits. So this is something again that you should uh, take a call based on your particular application's requirements and that's why we are giving all the necessary environment variables here for you to enable either rail binding or rail sharing. So this is again something that is very critical and uh, one of the most common issues that we have seen uh, when it comes to uh, HPC users running MAPH2 on uh, like large systems or small systems, bad uh, process to uh, core uh, mapping strategies. So MAPH2 has support for a lot of uh, process to core mapping strategies. Okay, so by default, what we try to do is we try to always bind the process to a, a given core. But if you have, uh, and this is how like some uh, mapping strategies would work. So suppose you have a core level mapping with a bunch uh, like policy and if your socket looks like this, so let's say if you have a system with uh, two sockets and four cores per socket, if you say that my CPU binding policy is bunch and granularity is core, then it would bind all four processes to the same socket. On the same vein, if you say it is scatter uh, or if you say that my binding granularity is a socket or a NUMA node, then what MAPH2 would try to do is, it would bind all four processes to one socket, but the uh, process would be free to move within uh, the various cores on the socket. Okay. So same with scatter. So with bunch, if you see everything uh, was on the same socket, but with scatter, they are kind of scattered, like it will be 0, 1, 2, 3, now it will be in a round robin fashion. So this is like a scatter mapping with core level granularity. This is a scatter mapping with a socket level granularity which means that the processes are free to uh, move about between uh, all the cores within the socket but they will not uh, be moved to a different socket. Now why is uh, process affinity so important? It is because of uh, non-uniform memory access costs, NUMA. Because uh, suppose rank 0 was ra running on socket 0, okay? all the memory and data structures related to rank 0 would be on the NUMA banks on the L2 caches or L3 caches. Uh, related to this socket. But if you do not bind this process to this socket, the there is no guarantee that it will remain here. It is possible that the uh, kernel can schedule this uh, process on a, a separate socket. And when that happens, you would have a lot of cache misses because earlier all the data related to this process was uh, on the NUMA banks related to socket 0. So this is why process to core affinity is very important. But this can also backfire in a very bad way if you are using MPI plus OpenMP or MPI plus threads kind of applications. So suppose in this scenario, rank 0 was uh, launching let's say 
two two threads and ram 2 was launching uh, uh, like two threads okay and you have a open mp for loop saying that i want to uh, make this for loop twice as fast if you are using uh, the default core level granularity with uh, uh, with bunch mapping what would let's say in, in this case what would happen is that this would end up with two threads two threads two threads and two threads and each thread would only get 50% of the cpu so even though technically there are there are enough number of cores available to have eight different threads running because of bad process mapping strategies you ended up with over subscription and worse performance from the application developer's perspective is like what the heck i thought openmp will double my performance and i'm getting uh, like uh, worse performance than uh, like without openmp so this is uh, what happened so you because of bad process to core mapping strategies you ended up with over subscription and poor performance instead of better performance so this is something that you should be very careful about when you are launching uh, like multi thread applications or mpa plus open mp kind of applications these are some of the most common problems that we see on uh, hpc systems when we are uh, when people are trying to run such uh, cases so for uh, the uh, many core kind of architectures this is a new binding policy that we have come up with like a hybrid binding policy so this basically uh, allows the uh, user to say that i want a, uh, i'm running a mpa plus thread application and i know that i will be running x number of threads per mpa process please reserve so many physical cores for each process so this is uh, starting with uh, 2.3 ga this is our uh, new default binding policy Uh, to uh, so that we ensure uh, mvapsh2 runs fine on the uh, emerging multi and many core kind of systems with uh, like mpa plus openmp kind of uh, uh, programs so this is uh, like a uh, example of uh, how hybrid mpa plus threads binding would work with different kind of uh, uh, binding policies in mvapsh2 so this is uh, with the uh, compact binding policy and this is uh, with the uh, linear binding policy note how uh, the uh, ranks uh, and the sockets uh, change uh, for for the different kind of policies so how do you figure out that you did the right mapping or or the uh, right process to core uh, binding so that is why we introduced the mv2 show cpu binding environment variable so this can be set to different granularities like uh, one or two one would show how the binding happened on uh, the node with uh, global rank 0 and if you set it to 2 it would show the binding on all nodes and you also have the flexibility to uh, set weird or user defined cpu mappings if any of the default mappings is not good enough for you so you can do that using the mv2 cpu mapping uh, environment variable so you can say that i want the uh, like process 0 on core 0 1 on core 1 2 on core 5 and 3 on core uh, like 2 on core 4 and 3 on core 5 so you can also do all sorts of weird mappings and to ensure that the process binding is working as expected please uh, use this environment variable to make sure the uh, no over subscription happened okay so this is something that is uh, quite important and of the of the past four or five slides i would say this is kind of the key takeaway slide from here so make sure you if you are getting really bad performance with mpa plus open mpa mpa plus threads kind of applications make sure over subscription is not happening so for all the administrators out there this is uh, uh, one thing that would really uh, help you if a user comes back and say that hey i am getting horrendous performance what the heck is going on so this is probably what is happening with the like npa plus threads kind of application so we also have support for like a lot of collective operations for both blocking and non blocking we have uh, a lot of uh, high end internode designs as well as intranode communication designs we have support for uh, shared memory linux cma and xpmem based internode operations we also have um, uh, like uh, a lot of high end internode communication schemes like uh, those that use hardware multicast or sharp from uh, melanox so these are uh, designed for both performance as well as uh, overlap so that you get good overlap for non blocking collectives and good performance for blocking collective operations and this is the kind of benefits you get if you are using like uh, multicast aware mk bcast on infinite band system so this is uh, like a very nice graph that i like so as you can see the scalability as the number of uh, nodes increases is really really good for small or large messages so whether you are running on 16 nodes or 6000 nodes you get the same performance for your mpa broadcast so this is like a key takeaway 
if you want good scalability for MPA broadcast kind of operations on large supercomputing systems. So it is also applicable to uh, other MPA collectives like uh, Scatter. So if you have an infinite band based system which supports uh, hardware based multicast, then we definitely recommend that you enable it at configure time in a web history using this feature and by default it is enabled and you enable it at runtime using this mv 2 use mcast equals 1 and uh, the user guide has more information on how you can uh, enable the hardware based uh, multicast uh, feature at runtime and at configure time and what are the system related changes that are required for that. And these are some benefits that uh, you can get at uh, your application or a micro benchmark level if you are using the new Sharp based collective. So Sharp is basically a network offload as uh, Deva and uh, Gilad had introduced in their respective talks. So here uh, your reduction would happen in the network. So you get significant performance benefits for your small to medium sized uh, messages using the current version of Sharp. And this is how you can enable <coughs> Sharp at configure time and runtime in MWH2. So now we are kind of uh, heading into uh, like blocking collectives versus uh, non-blocking collectives. So what is the problem with blocking collectives? So as with your uh, like uh, blocking versus non-blocking point-to-point operations, the story is the same. With blocking collectives, you have a series of computations and communication operations with absolutely no potential of overlapping communication and computation. So for a lot of applications, this is inefficient. So for instance, the application that Alessandro was uh, using, uh, using blocking communication would be highly inefficient. However, with non-blocking communication, the theory is that there is some communication support entity which is going to uh, progress the non-blocking communication or let's say the communication operation in the background while the application is uh, doing computation in the foreground. So this is the theory. So the theory is always beautiful you will have a good overlap of computation and communication so that th this is what would happen instead of uh, you having computation communication uh, in, in a sequential operation but the practice or the devil is in the details so who the heck is this communication support entity so what is actually going to progress this communication is it going to be a hardware resource is it going to be a software resource so what is actually going to progress the communication is the uh, like most critical question so this is again a, like a summary of uh, non-blocking collectives. So this is typically how you would write non-blocking collectives. So this is a case where the application itself is poking the MPA library to see if the collective operation finished using MPA test or MPA probe calls. But this is not a really uh, like scalable way and what people typically en uh, end up doing is they'll pepper their application with varying number of test calls. But there is no real way to identify how many number of test calls are required to ensure progress. And what will end up happening is most uh, mostly the uh, communication will finish in the wait operation. So we did a lot of work uh, in our group to uh, enable such uh, overlap using, uh, for instance, basic RDMA primitives using RDMA read and RDMA write. And these are the kind of benefits uh, that you will get. And this would uh, these designs will be available in future Apache 2x releases. So as you can see, with non-blocking all to alls and with the application that is capable of using uh, non-blocking all to alls by overlapping computation with communication, you get significant benefits if you are using an RDMA aware uh, MPA library which is capable of truly overlapping computation and communication uh, in, uh, well. So you get a significant benefits and the benefits are kind of constant. So th th this is a uh, like a weak scaling example and you can see that you get like a pretty good benefits across uh, like uh, a wide range of system sizes. So you can also have uh, overlap using uh, the Sharp protocol because basically Sharp is being progressed by the network, not uh, the end, uh, end process themselves. So you can have, uh, for instance, like a non-blocking all reduce for small messages using uh, Sharp. And uh, this has been uh, available in uh, the MWAPH2 MPA library for uh, like uh, quite a while now. And you see pretty good uh, like uh, performance as well as overlap uh, with such a design. So uh, yes. Um, is that so? But is that all in MPA two? Yes. And is it just work or do you have to enable it somehow? 
So uh, you need a sharp running on your system. So it needs a sharp aggregation daemon. So there are like uh, two processes that needs to uh, uh, run. So there, there is a sharp uh, daemon that needs to run on each node. And there is an aggregation manager that needs to uh, uh, run on one node on the system. And they need to talk to each other. So once this has been set up, you need to configure MAPS to four uh, sharp as I showed like three or four slides back. And uh, with this, you will get the uh, kind of uh, like benefits that you show here. And note that as Deva and uh, Gilad mentioned, the current version of Sharp that you have on Sierra or which is currently available on the uh, I think uh, Spectrum range of switches, which is basically EDR, uh, is only uh, designed for small to medium messages, adds up to like 2K. If you are looking for large message like megabytes all to all, uh, that support uh, is not available natively right now and Baptist 2 can do that by pipelining things but uh, the performance may not be uh, like what you expect you, you, you may not get 100% overlap you still need to poke uh, the communication once in a while so for your HPC kind of applications you would still get a uh, very good overlap here so uh, going forward uh, there are also techniques to uh, overlap computation and communication at the um, uh, network level so sharp was uh, at the um, host level not at the network level so th th that is basically called core direct so what core direct allows you to do is it allows you to offload a sequence of uh, com uh, communication operations like sends and receives to the uh, infinite band hca so instead of uh, saying that i want to do a send a receive a send a receive a send a receive instead of the application having to do that uh, like n number of times it can create a task list and say that I want to do, I want to wait for some message. So once that message arrives, I want to do a send, a send, a send, wait for something else, then do another send. So I can create a task list like this, offload the entire task list to the channel, uh, the HCA, which would then progress the communication and it would uh, do all the sends and receives based on how the user configured it. So this is uh, pretty useful if you are uh, trying to offload entire uh, series of operations like collectives to the channel adapter. So the benefit here is that because all of this is being done by the HCA, the application is free to do its own compute at this point in time. So potentially if you have an MPA library which uses features like this, it allows for true overlap of computation and communication. And these are the kind of benefits that you get at the end application level with different kind of uh, um, uh, HPC application. So th this is an example with HPL and this is available currently in uh, MAPH 2X. So uh, finally let me quickly touch upon uh, the MPI uh, T support that we have uh, in MAPH 2. Uh, so I think Dr. Panda and uh, Dr. Shende already mentioned this so I will not uh, uh, like uh, belabor this uh, too much. So the, uh, sh the short story here is that uh, MPI T have, has two kind of uh, variables, performance variables and control variables. Performance variables tell uh, tell you internal details of the MPI library. So you, you saw a huge list of uh, uh, performance variables uh, that was uh, listed uh, in previous talks, right? So that kind of information cannot be exposed by the PMPI or which is the current debugging interface or profiling interface that MPI has. So it can only tell you that so many bytes were sent or so many uh, like uh, broadcast bytes were sent. It can't tell you that uh, let's say MAPH2 has 19 different algorithms for broadcast. So which one of these algorithms were, was invoked? How many bytes did that send? How many uh, bytes did that receive? So it, it does not offer you the kind of granularity that many uh, people want. The same with control variables. So control variables are similar to environment variables. So I, I introduced a lot of environment variables before, right? So those environment variables can be set and unset at a global level once when the application starts up. But what if you want to change them dynamically when the application is actually running? So that is where a control variable can be used. So programmatically, you can say that, okay, for this section of my code, I want this particular thing to be set. Or for this section of the code, I want the same variable is to be set to a different value. So that's what control variables allow you to do. So you can do things at a much finer granularity, potentially giving you better uh, performance. And uh, this was what uh, Dr. Samir Shende had highlighted uh, in his uh, talk earlier as to how you can work with a performance monitoring uh, system like Tau and a good uh, like, uh, uh, li li library like MAPH2 to, to get best performance for your end application. So I'll just uh, quickly skip across this because uh, Dr. Shende just mentioned this uh, today. And uh, 
like this support is kind of available right now in uh, mapish 2 uh, together with tau so you can use uh, various performance and control variables to dynamically change application behavior and get a uh, better performance so these are the, like the list of um, uh, control variables that currently mapish 2 supports which can be changed dynamically at uh, uh, runtime and these are the, like the, the laundry list of uh, the various uh, performance variables So uh, with that, let me uh, quickly go over some of the features of MAPIS2 uh, GDR. But before that, uh, any any questions on uh, what has been uh, like discussed till now? Okay. If not, let's uh, quickly go over the, this as well. So, how many of you are aware of uh, what a CUDA aware MPA library is? Okay, one, two, fair number. Okay. So uh, typically, uh, what happens uh, uh, if you want to do a um, let's say write a CUDA aware application. So what you would do is um, you would take data from the host to the GPU, do a compute, take the data from the GPU back to the host, do a send and bring it back. Okay. So there are a lot of steps here. So the application developer has to be aware of what is going on. So instead, what if you could uh, have an MPA library which can handle data in the GPU and uh, transfer data from GPU to GPU either locally or on remote node without any uh, user involvement. So that at a high level is what uh, a CUDA aware MPA library is. So that the application developer only has to do an MPA send and an MPA receive and the MPA library will take care of getting the data from the device, sending it through the network or on, on the local node to the remote GPU device. So this leads to high performance and high productivity. Yes. This is GPU direct. So this is showing the same thing at a high level, but this is not as simple as that. So GPU direct basically allows the HCA to access the GPU memory. So you saw this uh, like uh, animation, right? Yeah. Saying that the data was going from here, uh, like through the uh, HCA, that is enabled by GPU direct. Okay. So how does uh, the InfiniBand HCA uh, do RDMA? Th that is because the HCA can access the memory of the uh, sitting on the host. So similarly, GPU direct enables the HCA to access the memory of the GPUs. Okay, so it's an enabling technology which uh, achieves this uh, end goal. So we have had the support. Uh, yes. But, but in that animation, is, is the blue like supposed to be a CPU? Uh, the blue is supposed to be a CPU. Yes. But it, it could actually be a PCI. Yes. Switch, yes. In which case, it doesn't touch. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So technically this is not a CPU, let, let, let me correct that. So this is showing things at a very high level because we are combining about 16 different parts in this animation. So depending on whether the data is going from node to the, like, let's say you have two GPUs on the same socket, two GPUs on the different socket on the same node, two GPUs on different nodes, two GPUs on different nodes and uh, the IP and the HCR are on different sockets. So you have tons of combinations and for each one of these combinations, you have different uh, like uh, paths th that you, you can enable. So for certain paths, taking data from the GPU directly to the HCA through the PCI might be better. For certain other paths, staging the data from the uh, GPU to the host, then sending it from the host to the remote host and then staging it back might be better. So what we want to highlight is that there are ballpark 16 different paths. Okay. So the application developer does not have to worry about these 16 different paths. Instead, they can just do an MPI star operation and the MPI star is going to ensure what of the 16 paths is best for the current uh, communication. If it is intra node, inter node, intra socket, inter socket, so on and so forth. So that is where this uh, like gives you the benefits. But, uh, this, this one. but does he have to specify like uh, how, how would you know automatically that this or that uh, operation is better for the for the user application. Uh, research, painful experience. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, we initially started out saying that hey, why don't I do GPU direct? Then I figured, like, oh shoot, I can't do GPU direct beyond uh, 16k. My performance sucks, and uh, I can't do GPU direct uh, when I'm going in one particular direction to the GPU or the other direction to the GPU. So. Painful experience, long research uh, uh, led us to figure out okay, there are 16 different paths, and uh, if you are going from this uh, like GPU to host or host to GPU, 
like a works or b works so that's basically it that's the short version the long version is that uh, like there are about two phd theses that and one masters thesis that came out from that so that's a long version of it how we figure out which path is the best okay thanks sure um so going forward so gvr has support for all of these things so efficient uh, small message communication with uh, gpu direct uh, rdma and it, it uses all of these different uh, options um uh, and this is the kind of performance that you get from device to device i think dr panda introduced this uh, in his uh, overview talk so you get pretty uh, close to host to host communication performance yes uh going back to the to the same question just <coughs> just a follow up mm. um, so now that you guys have done like two phd's on this like is this is this like a technology that we have access to yeah. like if i want to use it uh, right now is it is it available yes okay uh, so go to a download page uh, mf2 download You can download GDR, like a Mapstool GDR. It's an RPM. Install it, and uh, you should get this. Provided your system is configured correctly. Uh, no, uh, uh, the part where you define the which route is better is the one that I'm most interested in because mm -hmm. it's the one that I'm using in my current research. Mm -hmm. And I was like thinking about how to do it, and you guys have already done it. So I, I was wondering if I could just have access to it with some private things that you guys have here. So uh, trust me, you don't want to look at the code. Uh, <laughs> so we wrote it, and it is uh, horrendously complicated. So we have if conditions which are like uh, uh, um, like we uh, one if condition could have eight sub conditions in it. So it is horrendously complicated. Like uh, if you want to figure out what it is, I would first say you read the papers. There are about like ten papers I can point you to, so that you get an idea of what's going on, and th th then go go forward from there. So the basic MAP is to code has some of the CUDA awareness uh, uh, in it already. So take a look at that. That'll be a good place to start. Yeah, just so you know, it's because I'm using FPGA as opposed to GPUs. That's ah, what, that's why I'm interested. Okay, yeah. that's a whole different ball game. So <laughs> we we can take that offline. Uh, Bracy or Matt, do you guys have a comment on that? You can use the microphone if you want. So so one il one way to illustrate how complicated it is is the transport mechanism. Yeah, you have to use UD and um, let's see, Unreal and and then RD. Yeah, so you RC, have to use yeah. both, and that makes it really complicated, apparently. Um, that's putting it mildly. One area that is complicated. So um, there is no easy way to figure it out. It it will take a solid six to eight months of. Uh, Uh, like uh, understanding the concepts first, then figuring out uh, how the code is. So uh, it's a long and arduous process. Uh, and since it's been done from a as a PhD student, I don't know if it's uh, like worth worth another publication. So that's why I suggested like use it, try to build on top of it, and do something better. So uh, that that will be something that offers you like a publication potential instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. And like UCX also has like a, as. Um, Pasha showed uh, uh, in his talk. I don't know if you like paid attention, but uh, in his talk, Pasha showed that uh, like UCX currently has support for uh, like GPU Direct. So uh, that's also something that you can look at if you if you want to. Okay. So th this is the kind of performance that we get on open power systems with NVLink and Pascal. So again, this is uh, without GPU Direct RDMA, and this is with GPU Direct RDMA. So with GPU Direct RDMA, you get pretty close to uh, like host to host communication performance, and without GDR, uh, you get like uh, uh, much worse performance because data needs to be staged now onto the uh, ho uh, host and then sent from there. But uh, we, we believe that uh, the Newer open power systems are, are are coming with this GPU direct RDMA technology, and we'll try to uh, retake some of these numbers with uh, GPU direct RDMA and see how how they perform. And these are some of the environment variables you can play around with uh, if you want to uh, control various parameters. And more details are available in uh, the user guide here. And these are some uh, uh, like uh, application level performance numbers showing uh, what benefits you can get at the application level. Uh, if you are using GDR versus uh, uh, not using uh, GDR, so GDR also has support for uh, like multi-rail communication, and this shows the kind of benefits you get for device-to-device -device internode communication, uh, like bandwidth and bidirectional bandwidth. If you are using one rail uh, versus uh, two rails, 
and we also have support for efficient intra node communication using CUDA IPCs. So CUDA IPC is similar to the ROCAM technology that uh, AMD just uh, brought out for their Fire Pro uh, uh, devices. So it, it allows you to, suppose you have this, without IPC what would happen is that you will have to take the data to the CPU and uh, bring it back from the CPU to a different GPU. With IPC you can go from GPU directly to a remote GPU without touching the CPU uh, memory. Okay, so it has uh, like a lot of uh, uh, benefits. Uh, so we typically use uh, such IPC based uh, schemes for uh, large message uh, transfers inside MAPISHA. These are some of the benefits that you get using appropriate uh, designs uh, for like different message sizes when you are using shared memory for the right uh, uh, message sizes and IPC for the right message sizes. And you have also like a lot of other designs. Uh, this, this is what I mentioned that we like two PhDs came out of this. So these are the designs that came out of uh, those two uh, PhDs. And we have lots of uh, uh, environment variables which you can play around with uh, to increase the number of IPC buffers or reduce it, so on and so forth. And all of these are available in our uh, user guide as well. Go through them and see uh, if for your particular system, uh, one set of environment variables is giving you better performance uh, over uh, the other. And this is a kind of the kind of benefits that you get for uh, like large messages. So typically, IPC is used for uh, large messages in an to GDR, and this is the kind of benefits you get uh, for large message communication when you are using uh, IPC. We also have efficient support for data type based operations. So far, we have been looking at basic, uh, uh, simple data type like integers, floats, not complicated ones like structures or. Um, uh, let's say uh, vectors or H index vectors, things like that. But if you look at scientific applications, more often than not, they use uh, like user defined data types, which are not simple integers or floats. So, how do you uh, handle these things? Because with data types, your data may be located in several places in memory. So, you could have some data here, some data here, some data here. So, how do you pack all of these things and unpack them? On the host, you can do it with uh, mem copies, but what do you do on the device? Do you uh, like do like five different CUDA memory copies, bring it on the host, then pack them and send it out? Or uh, what we do is a, a more optimized way uh, where we try to um, do. Oops, I have the graph. Yeah. So, what we try to do is we try to do all of this on the uh, GPU device itself. So, we launch a kernel which tries to do this packing and unpacking on the GPU device. So, uh, by, by launching several kernels uh, in a pipeline fashion, uh, instead of in a back to back fashion, we get significant improvement in performance and uh, like we also reduce the over overhead of having to bring the data back to the host and doing the uh, like uh, packing and unpacking on the host. So these are like really advanced designs that uh, we have done inside the MPA library so that end applications which most probably end up using data types get performance. and. Uh, these are the kind of benefits that you get at the application level. So Cosmo, I think Dr. Panda mentioned in his talk is the weather forecasting application in Switzerland and uh, using such <coughs> advanced GPU based data type processing, you get significant benefits at the application level using uh, like MAPS2 GDR. So these are the kind of designs that have gone into MAPS2 GDR. So we have like, uh, like point to point level designs, collective level designs, a lot of designs for data types. Uh, like similarly uh, like remote memory access operations things like that so a lot of these things have gone into the mfs gdr code over the last five to six years through a close collaboration with partners like nvidia as well as uh, this was done in collaboration with nvidia and the swiss uh, national supercomputing center and uh, meteo swiss so meteo swiss is the uh, weather forecasting agency for uh, switzerland and CSCS is the swiss national supercomputing center which does all of their uh, HPC to, uh, to model uh, weather. And we have also support for uh, like managed memory. Uh, do you guys know what managed memory is? Um, show of hands. Okay. So uh, uh, basically managed memory uh, is where the memory can either be resident on the GPU or the CPU. Depending on from where it is being accessed, the CUDA driver will automatically move the memory to the particular uh, uh, like CPU or GPU. So this makes the job of uh, programming uh, much easier. So for instance, um, uh, you, you want to launch a kernel. Okay. So before launching a kernel, the, the most common thing people would do is do a CUDA memory copy, 
to ensure that the, the data is on the uh, GPU device, then launch the kernel. But if you have a managed memory, uh, what you can do is you can just launch the kernel and when the first access to the managed uh, memory happens, the CUDA driver automatically brings the data from the host to the GPU. Now once the computation is done, suppose if, if you want to access the same piece of data from the GPU, without managed memory, you would have to do an explicit mem copy back to the host. But with managed memory, the CUDA driver would automatically do the copy behind the scenes. So programmatically, productivity wise it's easier, but performance wise it's really bad because now you cannot do a lot of high end things like GPU direct RDMA or uh, uh, like IPC based transfers. So what we are trying to do is to see if we can get better productivity with better performance by taking care of uh, some things behind the scenes. So we have these advanced support for managed memory inside Anabash 2 GDR as well and these are the kind of benefits that you get uh, with that. So uh, I know I'll skip over because we already had a fairly uh, long demo and these are some benefits that you get. So I introduced a bunch of environment variables, a bunch of designs and things like that, right? So this is kind of uh, a summary of the benefits that you would get if you did all of those tunings the right way. So we call this as uh, application level tuning or best practices. This is not done by, like all of it is not done by us. A lot of this was uh, like contributed by our partners and uh, our colleagues and collaborators from other institutes like TAC and San Diego Supercomputing Center. So I mentioned the, uh, the Im impact of eager threshold tuning, right? So this is the kind of benefits that you get if you tune the eager threshold to the right value for the amber molecular dynamics application. So, uh, and, um, so, so that you can reproduce whatever uh, we are showing here, we give you details of what library was used, what flags were used, what were the input files used, uh, things like that. So you can go back to your systems and try to reproduce these uh, results on your system. So this is the benefit of using the right eager threshold for the right application. So that was the case with uh, Amber. This is the case with the mini AMR. So as you can see, you get pretty decent improvements uh, in performance at end application level if you are using the right set of tuning parameters. So this is the impact of choosing the right uh, transport protocol. So uh, if you go back a few slides, uh, I would have introduced the benefits of using either a purely uh, UD or a combination of UD and RC. So here uh, we show the benefits uh, for the SMG 2000 application with only using UD instead of RC. So you get good scalability at uh, very large scales. So similarly, this is the impact of uh, using uh, only the UD transfer protocol instead of the RC for the neuron application. So you, you see that as the number of processes increases, the benefits keep on increasing. So this goes back to the earlier statement that UD is more scalable uh, than RC. So if scalability is important to you and for, if your application does not do a lot of uh, RDMA based operations, then maybe you should use UD instead of uh, RC. So we also do extensive tuning for collective operations on different systems. So this is the impact of such uh, uh, improved collective tuning on, uh, like for different applications. And these are some uh, like advanced design that we have in Apache 2 x called user mode uh, memory uh, registration. I think Dr. Panda already introduced uh, this in his uh, talk earlier, so I will not go into more details here. And this is again going back to uh, the Hundi Blue application which I showed a few slides back uh, which highlights the impact of uh, GPU direct RDMA or MAPS2 GDR for end applications. And these are some uh, like numbers which show uh, like scalability on uh, the Omnipath system. So, so far whatever we showed was on InfiniBand and these are some of the scalability numbers on Omnipath for different kind of applications comparing MAPS2 and uh, Intel MPI. So these are some of the plans uh, for us. So we want to see if we can do tag matching and use the adapter memory. So both of these, uh, if you remember in uh, Gillard's talk as well as uh, the talk that Deva had given. Uh, so these are some of the upcoming features um, coming up from uh, Mellanox. And NVLink is already there uh, on a lot of systems. We are trying to see if we can utilize that to further enhance the performance of MAPH2 GDR and GPU related uh, operations. These are some of the other things that we have worked on like topology aware collectives, energy aware designs, virtualization support, all of which uh, Dr. Panda had introduced in his slides. So with that, we come to the end of MUG and my tutorial. Uh, I hope you had a, a good time. Uh, I hope this was informative and enjoyable for you. Uh, and Thank you.